Okay, uh, welcome to our imaging mass spectrometry workshop. Uh, I'm Kylie, um, this is Dan. Uh, we'll be walking you through um, introduction to working with mass spectrometry imaging with the R package Cardinal. Uh, since we're a smaller group, I'd actually like to start by just going around the room and kind of introducing ourselves so I can have some sense of what each of your backgrounds are. Um, so I guess I'd like to know just who you are, your name, where you come from, um, how long you've been working with uh, mass spec imaging, uh, and how long you've been working with R, and just generally a uh, brief summary of what you do. So I'll start. Hello, my name is Kylie Bemis. Uh, I work in developing statistical methods and software for mass spectrometry imaging here at the Cori College of Computer Sciences at Northeastern University. Um, I'm a member of Olga Vitek's uh, lab for computational proteomics. And I've been working with R for quite a long time, as you can imagine. And I've been working with mass spectrometry imaging uh, since the start of my PhD, which was, oh, now some almost seven or so, seven, eight years ago. Uh, we are a purely computational lab, so I don't actually have any hands-on experience performing any experiments. We get all of our data from collaborators that we're very grateful for. Um, so my experience is purely with analyzing the actual data sets, which is what we'll be talking about today. So if we just like to go around the room, uh, we'll start with you. All right, thank you. So we have a fairly diverse audience, I think. Um, so this workshop is designed to handle uh, that. So we'll start off with a brief introduction to mass spec imaging for those of you who are a little bit newer to it. I'm sure the first couple slides will be reviewed to some of you, but we won't spend too much time on that. Uh, and then we'll just uh, talk a brief, briefly about um, kind of a statistical perspective on mass spectrometry imaging, uh, the background of where we are coming from in terms of designing Cardinal, um, how to work with it. Uh, we'll then move into hands-on activities, uh, working with some, loading some data sets, doing some visualization, uh, manipulating data, pre-processing, that kind of thing. Uh, I know the uh, official schedule has the first hour and a half as a lecture and the second hour and a half as a hands-on, but we're going to be mixing it up a little bit more than that. Um, probably the first 10, 15 minutes or so here will be the most uh, in terms of the slides that we'll be showing. Uh, then we'll be jumping into some hands-on, back to a couple slides when we get to talking about uh, the particular methods, uh, the particular statistical methods, and then back to hands-on, kind of back and forth. Uh, so again, um, if you have not uh, seen it, there is a link here on Piazza to a Google Drive with the presentations. If you follow that link, you'll get to this page. Uh, this is our Google Drive for this, uh, this section. You'll actually start here, find us in program three, and this will contain this, uh, these slides as well as several folders that contain the other documents that we'll be working through. I also have a link, a couple of links down here uh, on Piazza to imzml.org, which has links to some additional example imzml files that I'll be working with. Um, so some of these are relatively small. Um, should be able to download them relatively easily. The first one up here that has a link to Pride is a bit larger, so if you haven't downloaded that one already, you might want to do that over break or um, just run that at home later on. Um, we also have some links to some IMZML converters if you happen to bring any of your own data sets that are not yet in IMZML. Uh, was everyone able to uh, install R, R Studio, the required software, and all of that? Okay. So we'll start off just by talking um, a little bit about uh, mass spectrometry imaging and um, our perspective coming from a statistical mindset, thinking about mass spec imaging, and a brief introduction to Cardinal. So again, a brief outline of what we'll be covering. Um, 
So to start off, uh, mass spec imaging. This will be review for a few of you. Um, we're essentially collecting mass spectra from a large number of pixels. We start with a tissue sample that we put on a slide. Um, there is some kind of ion source. In this case, there's an image of a DESI source. And there is an arm here that kind of moves and ionizes the different points along the sample so that we can collect potentially thousands and hundreds of thousands of mass spectra from different locations on the sample. Uh, the idea then is once we have these hundreds or thousands of mass spectra, we can fix at particular mass locations um, along the MZ axis and plot these false or uh, molecular ion images that show us the relative spatial abundance of the different molecules in the sample. So here's a little um, example data set that we'll be looking at a little bit later. This is a cross-section of a pig fetus. You can see the brain here on the left, this dark region. The big dark region is the liver, and in the center we have the heart. And for example, this particular ion over here is mostly abundant in the heart. This one over here is mostly abundant in the liver, and so forth. So in terms of the biotechnological problem that we have when we're trying to statistically analyze this uh, kind of data, there's a lot of uh, challenges. So firstly, we have rapidly advancing technology. If you're relatively new to mass spec imaging, the technology looks totally different than it did when I first started. Um, we have increasing mass resolutions and spatial res resolutions, so we have uh, machines that have much greater mass accuracy than before and also much better spatial resolution than before, so we're able to look at um, smaller and smaller locations, more and more, uh, collect from more and more pixels. Um, these days we're starting to look at some more complex experiments. You might have seen some images from 3D experiments. Those are not quite as common, um, but they do exist. And just generally more complex experiments as we get more comfortable with collecting data from multiple samples with mass spec imaging. In terms of the challenges when it comes to statistical analysis, well, we're looking at complex high dimensional data. So we have collected all of these mass spectra from different locations on the tissue, so they're all spatially correlated. Um, we potentially have a, so we have at least two spatial dimensions. We can potentially have a third spatial dimension if we're looking at 3D data, potentially a time dimension if we're looking at some sort of time course experiment. And then, of course, we have the MZ axis itself, so we have this um, axis of the mass to charge ratio, so that's another dimension. Complex correlation structures, the data is spatial, um, and there's also typically some sort of correlation between the different mass features. There are always a lot of molecules that will behave similarly to each other. Um, so when we in combine increasing mass and spatial resolutions, we get very large data sets. Some of the data sets that we had when I started working with mass spec imaging ranged from, say, 100, 200, 500 megabytes or so, and these days we routinely see data sets that are tens to hundreds of gigabytes. So the uh, size of the data has increased by an order of magnitude at least. Um, experimental design for mass spec imaging also poses a little bit of a statistical challenge because when you think about it, um, we'll have lots and lots of data points, but most of those data points will actually be coming from the same sample. They'll just be coming from different locations on that sample. So when you think about sample size for mass spec imaging experiments, you actually need a lot more data than you might think at first, because even though we'll have hundreds or thousands of mass spectra, which seems like a lot, a lot of those will only be coming from a few samples. So in terms of thinking about statistics, there are a lot of things that we have to consider. There's technical variation coming from the data collection, how those tissue samples were handled. Um, from the analytics side, I can say that I can t you can very often tell who collected the data by how good the data actually looks. Um, I've 
just looking at data sets from one lab, I can often tell, oh, um, Christina collected this data or Olivia collected this data because I can tell the difference between the quality. So that's one huge source of variation, um, how the data is stored. So we'll be primarily looking at the IMZML data format, which is an open format. Um, but there are, of course, Mostly all of this data originally comes in proprietary formats, so there can be some conversion issues in terms of how the data is stored. How the data is processed is another huge source of variation. Depending on how you pre-process the data, that can have a huge impact on any downstream analysis that you do. Um, instrument variation, uh, if you're using uh, MALDI, that's matrix uh, uh, Matrix-assisted laser desorption ionization is one type of mass spec imaging. You'll have matrix effects from the matrix that you apply to the tissue in that case. Um, signal processing, this is part of the processing as well. And then biological variation. Um, the systematic biological variation is what we're trying to figure out, but there's always um, non-systematic biological variation just from na the natural variation between different samples. So from a statistical perspective, we're trying to control as many of these sources of variation as, as possible. A kind of bird's eye view um, in terms of statistics, uh, when we think about any sort of biological experiment, um, you have analytical method validation and system suitability testing. Uh, we won't really be talking about those today. All of those come in from the people who design the instruments, who test the instruments, um, calibrate the instruments, and all of that. Where um, we as statisticians and data analysts come in, in terms of designing the experiments, um, talking about the data acquisition and quality control once we get the data, making sure that that, that, that data is um, of a good quality, um, pre-processing it, uh, doing statistical analysis, and typically all of that will feed back into the design of future experiments. So this is the part of the workflow that we'll be talking about today. Um, a few things that we have to consider in terms of, ex in terms of experimental design um, is it's really always very important to consider what your actual experimental goal is when designing any kind of experiment. We'll talk through several different kinds of statistics uh, statistical analysis that we can do with mass spec imaging, and they're each tailored to different kinds of statistical and analytic goals. Um, so one of those statistical goals is some kind of class discovery. So this is some sort of unsupervised experiment where we don't necessarily know what we're looking, what we are looking for, and the goal of the experiment is to just to discover different analytes that occur in the sample and try to identify different patterns within the sample. So we're not trying to um, classify anything. We don't necessarily know what's in the data set. We might have some idea of what's in the data set because it comes from known organ or something like that, but we don't really know exactly what we're looking for. We're trying to discover what's inside the data set, what the data set tells us. Um, this is difficult, difficult um, typically one of the more difficult things to do, and it's always very hard to evaluate. Um, it's very useful for uh, visualization. It helps us understand the data. Another statistical goal is class prediction. Um, this one is relatively familiar and should be straightforward to understand. The idea is just that we have uh, data that has been labeled into different groups. In this case, um, some uh, tissue samples that come from tumor tissue or healthy tissue. And we want to learn a classifier for this kind of uh, data set so we can classify new, ta new tissue samples into either tumor or normal or whatever your class labels happen to be. Um, so we have some sort of known class labels. Someone has gone through and annotated the data with those class labels, um, such as tissue or normal. And we want to classify that data, develop a classifier for new data points, and report some, some sort of accuracy or misclassification error rate. And if you want to do any sort of biomarker discovery, um, typically some sort of class uh, prediction is going to be part of that process. And typically, that will require a very, very high accuracy. Um, and finally, another statistical goal that we'll be talking about today is class comparison. So this is a little bit different from um, classification from uh, 
class prediction. Um, we still have known class labels. So here I'm actually using the same example where we have two tissue samples. One of them is normal tissue, the other is healthy tissue. But rather than trying to classify or learn a classifier um, to classify new data points, what we're actually trying to find out is which analytes are differing between these two different conditions. So we're trying to, we're going to be looking at the different mass features, the different molecules in the sample, and trying to determine um, which of them have different abundancies between tumor and normal, or whatever your conditions happen to be. Um, and this is actually different than class prediction. That's something that is commonly um, a point, a common point of confusion. So whether, uh, whether a molecule is differentially abundant is different from whether that molecule is predictive. So here, for example, we're looking at um, the mean log abundance of different molecules. And in this case, we can see that it is um, both differentially abundant and predictive. I could draw a line through these different data points, and it would be very good at distinguishing whether that data point is coming from healthy or diseased tissue. And so the level of that abundance is changing between the two different conditions. In this case, the level, the mean, is also changing between the two different conditions, but I would have a very hard time drawing a line or any sort of classification rule um, using this particular molecule that would distinguish healthy versus disease um, from, the, from this data. So differentially abundant molecules are not necessarily predictive. And conversely, um, biomarkers and, and predictive molecules are also not necessarily differentially abundant. Um, so for example, here we have an example of a molecule that uh, does have a difference between two groups, and it's also, and it's also predictive. Um, this is an example of a molecule that is um, predictive. You could very easily come up with some sort of classification rule that distinguishes the different classes here. Um, but if we tried to find out a difference in means between these two different conditions, we wouldn't find any. So in terms of uh, designing experiments and carrying out uh, statistical analyses, it's very important to keep uh, the overall experimental goal in mind, both when you're designing the original experiment and also when you're actually carrying out the analysis. We're going to be breaking up the um, different uh, statistical methods we cover into which of these overall goals they fit into. Um, some particular aspects that you need to consider um, for mass spec imaging in particular is the number of biological replicates you have. Um, as we talked about a moment ago, you'll have many pixels, many mass spectra from the same sample. So even though you have a large volume of data in general, doesn't mean that that data is actually coming from um, many samples. Your sample size is still actually very small in most cases. Um, Another thing that's important to consider is randomization. Uh, I've seen a lot of mass spec imaging studies that uh, failed because you are, they always put the, um, the tissues on the slides in the exact same order or um, ran all of the healthy samples first and all of the um, disease samples second. And in those particular cases, um, well, all of the runs that they ran first, those will have, um, those will typically be different in some way than all of the runs that were done second, just to the run-to-run -run variation um, due to the instrument, and as well as whoever ran that. Um, and typically, there will also be some sort of um, slide effect or something like that, where you don't want to put all of the tissue samples in the same order or something like that. You'll typically want to randomize as much as you can. We'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to uh, talking about class comparison in more detail. OK, um, so that's a very brief and quick introduction to our general overall statistical mindset that I want to have. Um, and we'll come back to lots of these later on when we start looking at some of the specific statistical methods um, implemented in Cardinal and trying them out. I uh, just want to pause for a moment, see if there's any very general questions before we move on. Everyone good? Yes. <laughs> 
Um, well, I think um, adding some sort of fiducial marks uh, to examples mostly going to be useful if you're trying to do some sort of alignment between the optical images and the and the mass spectral data, as well as if you use some sort of other um, mode of imaging aligning like those as well. Uh, that doesn't really make any difference in terms of the actual um, randomization that you would want to do um, in terms of the order that you put the samples on this uh, and the order that you run uh, run those samples. Yes. What about like internal standards? Yeah, like mass standards. Yeah, internal yeah. mass standards. That's what I was using. I was using a fiducial that actually was a mass standard. So <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, standards are really good to have. We'll talk very briefly about normalization. And ultimately, um, having some sort of internal standard that you can expect to be relatively constant across all of your experiment, experimental runs and samples is going to be extremely useful when you're doing normalization. Um, there are lots of different kinds of normalization for mass spec imaging, and no one with has really found a consensus great one, but one of the ones that it typically outperforms everyone and all of the other ones is if you have some kind of internal reference, some kind of internal standard that you can use to perform the normalization. So if you have access to something like that and are able to do that, that's usually a good idea to do, yes. Uh, any other questions before we keep going? Okay, uh, so let's talk briefly um, about Cardinal itself. Uh, so Cardinal is an open source statistical software for mass spec imaging. Uh, as you know by now, it's based in R. It is an R package hosted on Bioconductor. It provides a full workflow for data processing, visualization, provides uh, various statistical tools um, such as image segmentation, classification, and now the new version will also include a class comparison. We have ex extensive documentation that we are trying to constantly update. Um, we have an active uh, group, Google help group where I try to answer questions and we've gotten to the point where sometimes we have uh, other users who are actually able to get to the answers for me. Um, this number is old. I think there's more than 3,000 unique downloads by now. Um, won the John Chambers Statistical Software, Software Award in 2015. So one thing I want to talk about briefly is why R. Uh, Cardinal is an R package. Um, it doesn't uh, currently have any sort of graphical user interface. It does, of course, produce visualizations, but there's no point and click interface right now. Um, so why use R, why code to do your analysis when there are other kinds of software that doesn't ask you to do that? Um, so there's a few different reasons for this. Um, in terms of R specifically, R is a lightweight um, language. It has minimal software and hardware requirements, so pretty much any laptop um, can run R. Um, you don't have to have any sort of big, powerful computer to run R or Cardinal, although, of course, it can help if you're working with larger data. Um, it is still interactive, so you will get you can get immediate responses as you're working with the data, um, even on a laptop. There is a huge um, developer support community for R. Um, we're able to uh, work with um, and leverage over 3,000 packages on CRAN, which is the um, comprehensive comprehensive R archive network. So we can. Always access. We always have access to the latest statistical methods if, you, if we if we choose. Um, there are of course methods implemented in Cardinal itself, but you can always use any of these other R packages um, if you can throw the data into the right format that they expect. Um, use any other statistical software that R provides. Um, it's relatively easy to customize um, to whatever your whatever your pipelines are. Um, you can extend it. You can. Uh, it's not that difficult to write new methods and incorporate it into whatever workflow that you need. Um, in terms of the science, R and coding is great for reproducibility. Um, <clears throat> Cardinal itself is all completely open, so you have access to all of the source, co source code. You can see me at new code as, um, as Cardinal develops. All of the algorithms themselves are open source, so you can read the paper that we use to create a particular method, how the algorithm works, see exactly how it's coded. Um, 
And um, R also provides us infrastructure for fully documentable workflows. So you can write up a analysis in an R markdown document or just in R itself and know that if someone else wants to reproduce exactly that same analysis, as long as they have access to the same data, they can run the same code and get the exact same results. So Cardinal, um, so what Cardinal, uh, part of its goal is that it's a software for mass spec imaging experiments and not just for data sets. Um, one major drawback, I think, a lot of other software that's designed for mass spec imaging is the focus on individual data sets and not necessarily analysis between different data. Uh, they're not real. Lots of other software are not really designed for full experiments to handle um, data coming from different from different samples, being able to keep track of the experimental runs, sample information, all of these other things. Any of that you can fully incorporate into the representation in Cardinal. For IMZML format, also Analyze 7.5. So if you've ever used uh, Biomap, for example, that uses the same format, uh, Analyze, and we use IMZML as our main format, which is the open format for um, exchange, interchange of uh, mass spec imaging data sets. Um, we have a lot of support for visualization, plotting both mass spectra and ion images, spectral processing, image processing, and of course, statistical analysis. Just a few photos, visualization tools. So this is a nice data set that we like that I like to show because oftentimes when you're trying to evaluate um, any sort of unsupervised um, methods for uh, mass spec imaging, such as sort any sort of segmentation method, it can be difficult to evaluate the results. We have a couple of data that where the the correct, inf the correct configuration, the ground truth is somewhat known. So this, for example, comes from a painting of a cardinal done on a slide. Um, and so we can actually reconstruct the original painting um, just from the mass spectra itself. And you can see it's kind of, it looks like a cardinal. It has a, a bit of writing in DESI mass spec. We have statistical methods that we'll be talking about. Um, fully documented and reproducible workflows. There's a companion package card called Cardinal Workflows that you should have also downloaded that provides a few example data sets and a um, full uh, workflow showing their analysis. Um, one more thing I want to spend a few moments talking about before we get to working um, hands-on with some data is the IMZML format itself. <clears throat> So IMZML is this uh, open format for exchange of mass spec uh, data, or mass spec imaging data. Um, it's gained a lot more popularity recently, which is very good for people like me who design open source software for mass spec imaging. Um, it's great because there are already exist a lot of converters from most proprietary formats to IMZML. Um, so it's a good file format for us to design around. And in the newest version of Cardinal, we've actually done a lot of um, uh, design work in terms of integrating directly with the IMZML format. Um, so I just want to talk very briefly about what that format looks like. So IMZML itself, um, if you have an IMZML data file, it's actually two separate files. Um, there is an XML part that's just markup language. It's human readable markup language, um, the XML part. And this will essentially just describe um, metadata about the experiment. It'll describe what lab it comes from, the locations of the different, um, the different mass spectra. And most importantly, this XML file describes where in this other file, this binary file, where we can find the mass spectra in that binary file. So the binary files themselves are not human readable. Um, we use a computer for that. Um, but the bi there's a, a binary file that contains all of the actual intensity data and potential the different spectra in the experiment. There are two um, kind of sub-formats of IMZML. Uh, there's processed IMZML and there's continuous IMZML that are designed for storing the data in slightly different ways. So what I've shown here is essentially what the binary file of IMZML for both processed 
continuous data. So the basic assumption between these two different formats is that for continuous IMZML, all of your mass spectra share the same MZ values, the same MZ axis. With processed IMZML, each mass spectrum will have its own set of MZ values where those intensities are measured. Um, so continuous IMZML, one MZ axis, all spectra share the same MZ values. Processed, um, each spectrum has its own MZ values. And we um, actually reflect this same format in how the data is represented in Cardinal as well. All right, um, so before we start looking at some actual files, any, I'm going to pause again, if, see if there's any questions so far. Yes? So for process and continuous, does that mean, since there's only one MZ array for continuous, that it can only be used for bit data, or can it be used for unbidden data? So, the, so in terms of the limitations on these two formats, or what kind of data they can represent, well, the only actual limitation is just as described that continuous data, sh all sh spectra share the same MZ axis. In process data, each spectrum has its own uh, MZ values. Um, in terms of what data that can actually represent, that kind of depends entirely just, in, these formats make no promises about the data that they actually represent. So if you want to represent your, um, the full um, all data that is in a continuous format, um, you can. Um, it may be very large, um, but certainly some smaller experiments that have a lower uh, mass resolution or smaller spatial resolution or both, you can certainly do that and have a continuous IMZML file that represents the unbin data. Um, just typically that usually comes from experiments that will have some um, So there's no actual promises in terms of what kind of data these represent. They're just formats, despite the name processed IMZML. Um, makes no promises about the data actually being processed in, in any way. It's just how the data is stored. Uh, yes? So just for me, this seems like the two names are opposite, because continuous is you're already processing and bin the data, right? Yeah, so again, that kind of goes back to how the names don't necessarily, are not necessarily meaningful. So um, in terms of how we work with the, the data in Cardinal, um, again, the continuous versus process really tells us is how the data is actually stored. It doesn't say anything about whether the data has actually been processed or not. So oftentimes in, in Cardinal itself, um, we'll start with continuous, go to processed as we do some processing, and then do some binning and alignment and go back to continuous. So the actual names of the files, exactly, they don't really, they don't, they're, they, they're not necessarily meaningful on their own. They only, they only say how the data is actually stored in the file. Any other questions so far? So that will, uh, that will depend greatly on what the file actually looks like, on what the data actually looks like. Um, so for example, um, processed IMZML, the main advantage is if you're using an instrument that only collects data when it has a strong signal, um, then a lot of points along your MZ, MZ axis may just be zeros, and you probably don't want to store that part of the data. Um, process, the, the processed IMZML format lets you do that. Um, essentially, the, the spectra will be sparse, so anything that had zero just isn't stored. Um, so processed IMZML can be much smaller in that situation. Um, in other situations where that's not the case and your instrument is recording uh, intensities along the entire MZ axis, um, probably continuous is going to be smaller because you don't, then don't have to store those same MZ values a bunch of different times. Um, so it depends entirely on how the data was collected and what the data actually looks like, which of these will be smaller. Any other questions so far? All right, well, I'm going to start off just by, actually, let me keep this full screen. I'm going to start off by taking a quick look 
add a couple example IMZML files to give a little bit of context to what we're talking about. So right here I have um, two, uh, it looks like four, but it's really just two IMZML files. Uh, these come from the, uh, the IMZML.org webpage. The particular ones I'm looking at right now are these, uh, these ones, this example um, process, example continuous IMZML that just have nine pixels, just have nine mass spectra. These ones are particularly tiny, um, just for that are intended just to do a sanity check on whatever software you're using, but they'll be helpful for us in terms of just briefly looking at the, what the format actually looks like. So as you can see, each file is actually two separate files. We have um, the .imzml. This is the XML portion that contains human markers describing the experimental metadata, and a .ibd file, this is the binary data that has the, the actual intensity data. So I'm going to open the IMZML part in a text editor here so you can see what that looks like. So this is the IMZML file. Um, if you've seen XML before, you can see that it just looks kind of like HTML tags. Um, we have different fields such as file description. These will contain different tags containing some basic uh, information about the file. For example, it uh, describes whether the file is continuous or processed IMZML. Um, with mass spec imaging, it's pretty much always going to be an MS1 spectrum. Uh, it's, you can also, it also specifies whether it's a profile or centroided spectrum. Uh, IMZML will always have a universally unique identifier that can be used to match the IMZML file to the binary part of the file and make sure you're using files that actually correspond to each other. Um, there is a SHA or MD uh, hash, uh, hash code that can be used to verify that the binary part of your data is actually um, uh, has integrity, is actually representing the same data that it was originally written as. So I'm going to scroll down here. So I've scrolled down here to the spectrum list. Um, this is line 127 for me. So this spectrum list in the IMZML file this contains all of the metadata information for the actual uh, spectra. This is essentially going to be telling us um, what the X and Y positions of the spectrum are, as well as where in the binary file we can find that particular spectrum. So for example, this first one here. This is the first spectrum uh, in the experiment um, at uh, X, equals 1, y equals 1, and it has these two um, sections, the mz array and the intensity array that give the locations of the mz values and the actual intensities in the binary part of the file. And if I scroll down a little bit more, this is the second spectrum. And because this is a continuous file, each of these MZ arrays, if we look at where they're stored in the binary file, they're all stored in the exact same location. I'm just going to open up the processed version as well. And this is just to show that the in the processed version, the locations of these MZ arrays are different. Okay, so now I'm going to go ahead and take a look at opening those two small example files using Cardinal. So I have open here the um, one dash intro dash cardinal dash and dash imzml file. Uh, this is in the if you look in our Google Drive, this is in the folder labeled one, exploratory analysis. 
So I'm going to be looking through, I'm going to be working through some of the documents in this, uh, in this exploratory analysis folder right now. And right now I have the introduction, the one that is labeled one. Oops. So there is an So for each of these documents, there is a .rmd file and a .html file. So each of these uh, is actually written using R Markdown. So if you have R Studio installed uh, and double click the .rmd file, it will automatically open in R Studio. Um, if you don't have R Studio installed, you can just open it in any text editor. And the .rmd file, this R Markdown file, um, will have the code used to generate the HTML document. And this is what I'm going to be working with right now. So the HTML version of this file should look like this. It'll have the images and all of this already loaded if you just want to follow along in that or you can follow along in the R Markdown uh, where I'll be working through the code. Is everyone caught up to this point? Everyone good? Okay, so now I'm just gonna practice uh, loading these example files. Um, I'm gonna start off by creating a variable called path. Uh, this just points to the folder where I saved all of my example files. So you should change this to wherever you happen to save your files. Um, I, actually pro I, actually, I actually created this on a different computer than I'm using right now. So you'll see me do the same thing. So these example files for me, I have them stored in a subfolder called test data. IMZML example. So here I've just created a variable that has a path to wherever I downloaded these data sets. And I also need to load Cardinal. I'm just going to do that just by running library cardinal. So now I'm going to load this first example file. Again, I'm going to need to edit this slightly because I have it in a different location than when I created this. So all I've done here is I've pasted together the path to where I downloaded the files and the path to the specific um, file that I'm going to load now. So right now, this file one variable looks like this, which is just um, the full path to where this particular example continuous IMZML file is stored. And now I'm going to use the read MSI data function in Cardinal to read this data set. So I'm just going to run that. And now if I look at the variable that I assigned that to, it should show that I um, have a MS continuous imaging experiment uh, loaded. All right, we are, since the R3.6 was just released and we're using the, we're actually using the developer version of Bioconductor right now because the new version of Bioconductor will be released uh, this Friday. So there may be some slight software issues in terms of uh, all of the CRAN uh, packages being uh, updated and everything. So. There, we may run into a few issues because of that, but hopefully everyone is able to still follow along. Um, and 
All of this should be a little bit more stable in the next few days when Bioconductor 3.9 officially releases. I'm going to keep uh, go ahead. I'm going to go. I'm going to go ahead and keep working, uh, walking through this right now. So right now, uh, X1 here is showing an MS continuous imaging experiment. And I'm just going to sanity check. Uh, I'm going to create the same images from the IMZML website. So let me. So these are the example images from the website, and ideally we want our images to look essentially the same to make sure that we are loading the data correctly. And in general, these images look mostly the same, which tells us that we've loaded the, the data sets correctly. I'm going to load the processed version of the same data. Oops. I need to update my path here again. And because this is a uh, proce uh, processed IMZML format, um, and each spectrum can have its own uh, MZ values, we can see from the loading messages that it had to determine the mass range because there, it had to look through all of the different MZ values for the different spectra. And we're going to go ahead and plot the images for this one as well. They should look identical. And we'll talk a little bit later about all of the options we used to plot those images. But I'm going to go ahead and pause again and see if anyone needs any help. So there's a, I suppose one slight issue that I'm seeing is since I have, in my example, I have um, a path set up where I have one folder where all of my other examples are kept, and then I'm combining the path to that folder um, with the partial uh, path to the specific uh, file that I'm loading to get the full path to the file. So um, I see some of you are just giving path the full path to wherever you wherever the specific file is, in which case you need to do this part, and you can just use the path itself. So the argument here to read MSI data should just be the path to whatever the file is that you actually want to read. Um, I tried to do something to make it a little bit easier here, and I think it ended up being a little bit, making it a little bit harder in some, in some instances. So here we're looking at um, the images for particular MZ values. Um, so what we're actually doing is um, forget about this for a moment. And um, think of the data like this, where we have uh, a bunch of different mass spectra. Um, in the processed case, the spectra may actually have different uh, MZ points along the MZ axis here. We're completely ignoring that right now. All we're concerned with is that we have different mass spectra, and we're selecting a particular MZ value, a particular point along the MZ axis that corresponds to some mass to charge ratio, and we're getting the intensity values from all of the spectra in the data set that correspond to that MZ value, or specifically, in this case, that MZ value plus or minus uh, 0.25. Um, so we're going to be getting potentially multiple intensities from each spectrum, uh, getting the mean of those, and then getting all of those intensities from across the entire data set, and those intensities will be represented as color at different points um, corresponding that to that spectrum. So for example, here, each of these different pixels has a different mass spectrum associated with it. 
um, we're fixing at a particular mass to charge ratio and plotting uh, the intensities for that mass spectrum represented here by the color of the pixel. Okay, so I'm going to keep going a little bit further. So we'll talk again when we, in a moment when we talk more about visualization, uh, what these different options that we used actually are. But for now, I'm going to take a moment to talk a little bit about what we actually loaded, this x1 and x2 that I, is what I've named the variables here. And if we just um, type x1 or x2 on the R console line and hit enter, it'll print for us a brief description of what the actual data set is. Um, we can see x1 here is an MS continuous imaging experiment because I loaded it from a continuous IMZML file. x2 here is an MS processed imaging experiment because I loaded it from a processed IMZML file. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about those exact differences in a bit. But we can see when it prints it out, it tells us how many um, mass features there are. So X1 here has 8,399 um, MZ values and nine pixels. X2 here has 5,199 mass features or MZ values and nine pixels. Um, it tells us the um, dimensions of the image if we uh, create the image as well as the actual pixel coordinates or the range of the actual pixel coordinates for X and Y here. And it also tells us the mass range of the experiment, um, whether or not the data is centroided, and it gives us some information about the exper experimental runs. Um, it makes the assumption that each different uh, IMZML file is a separate run. So by default, it will just name the experimental runs after the base name of the file itself. So each of these objects is actually um, an MS imaging experiment, which is how the um, mass spec imaging experiments are represented in R by Cardinal. And we can think of these as kind of matrix-like objects where the rows um, represent the mass features or the MZ values. So that's why this is printed like this. So we can essentially think of this object as having 8,399 rows where each of those rows is a different MZ value, and nine columns, where each of those columns comes from a different pixel, and the, and the column is really a mass spectrum. We can get the dimensions of the object using this uh, dim function, and it'll just print the number of features by the number of pixels. Um, these MS imaging experiments have information about the mass features as well as about the pixels. Um, we can obtain the metadata for either the features or the pixels by using the functions uh, feature data and pixel data. So here, for example, feature data extracts a um, mass data frame from the object that gives us um, essentially, all, in this case, all it has is the MZ values, but we could add additional columns to this mass data frame if we had some other kinds of annotations that we wanted to add to the different mass features here. There is an MZ function. This accesses the, uh, the MZ values of the experiment. So here I'm just going to look at the first 10 MZ values here. One thing to note is this uh, MZ accessor function um, accesses essentially a canonical list of MZ values for the entire experiment. So even if it's a process data set, the entire um, experiment will share one canonical list of MZ values. So in the case of process data, it at, does actually get binned on the fly at some point. We'll talk a little bit later about how we can change how that happens. 
It can use pixel data to access information about the pixels, metadata information about the pixels. So in this case, um, that includes the run information, what run each individual mass spectrum came from, the, and the X and Y coordinates of each mass spectrum. If we want to access the coordinates specifically, there is a chord function that will just that will give us a data frame of just the x and y uh, spatial coordinates. And if we want just the experimental runs that each uh, mass spectrum belongs to, there is a run uh, function that will extract the exper uh, a vector of the experimental runs. Um, Note, of course, that an MS imaging experiment can contain multiple runs. Uh, typically, each IMZML file will usually only contain a single experimental run. Um, so if you have an experiment with multiple runs, as is often the case if you have a full experiment, you would need to combine those together into a single um, MS imaging experiment in Cardinal. And we'll talk about how to do that a bit later. So now I want to explore a little bit the differences between continuous and processed IMZML files. And here I'm going to uh, look at this uh, S042 uh, example file from uh, the IMZML website. So uh, let's see. So this is going to be um, the S042 data set that you can get from uh, these download links at the bottom of the IMZML example files. Uh, these come from a urinary bladder data set. Um, like the smaller, simple example files, these, co these come in both processed and continuous formats. I'm going to load these to give a slight, to take a look at a slightly more complex, uh, a real data set in this case, rather than the, the tiny example one that's just nine pixels here. So again, I also need to update my path to the data sets a little bit here. So here, um, I've created a variable called underscore S042C. Uh, this is just, and this is just storing the full file path to the S042 continuous IMZML file. Um, you can either get that by um, pasting together the path where you stored all the data along with a specific file. Um, it doesn't really matter exactly how. The point is um, read MSI data just needs a, a string that contains the path to wherever the file is, that wherever it is you saved it. So right now I'm going to load this uh, urinary bladder data set, the continuous version right now. So I have this loaded. You can see this is the continuous version, so it's an MS continuous imaging experiment. It's a little bit larger than the tiny example data set here. Um, it has 300 mass features and 16,200 pixels. Uh, it has a pretty small uh, mass range, just 225 to 250 or so. Now I'm going to create the or a similar image to what's on the IMZML website here. So I'm going to look at MZ equals 230.1 plus or minus 0.25. The image on the IMZML website used a manually reduced maximum intensity, so we won't get the exact same thing, but we can see that it's close enough that we're looking at the same data. How is everyone doing? All right. OK. And again, we'll talk a little bit more about the options we use to create that image when we talk more about visualization. I am also going to load the processed version so I can talk a little bit about the differences between processed and continuous IMZML and how they're represented in Cardinal. 
So here um, I have two objects, S042C and S042P, that are the continuous and processed versions of this data set. If I plot the image here for the processed version, I should get the same image, and I do. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the continuous version of this. So um, because uh, it's coming from a continuous IMZML file, the intensities are stored as a dense uh, column major uh, file-based matrix. Um, by default, in the most recent version of Cardinal, the intensities themselves are not actually loaded into memory uh, when you when you first read the data set. Instead, the, the intensities are just read from the file whenever you actually want to either plot an image or request those intensities in some way. Um, you can change that by setting an argument called attach only in the read MSI function. So for example here, if I wanted to actually load all of the intensities into memory when I first read the data. I could set attach only to false. The default in the newest version of Cardinal is to set that to true, which means that the spectra are not actually loaded. If I, oops, oops, ah. I didn't want to do that here. So here, if I look at how the spectra are stored, um, when I use attach only equals false, they're just stored as a regular R matrix. Um, that means all of the intensities are loaded into memory. The default is attach.only equals true, which means that instead the intensities are not actually loaded into memory, um, but kept in the file and only accessed when we need them. Uh, in, a, in a continuous IMZML, since each spectrum shares the same MZ values, um, there's no binning performed in this case. So each row corresponds to a particular MZ value and has exactly the same and the, the exact same intensity values as in the original file. Take a moment to look at the processed version of this data set now. So here S042P is my uh, variable that has the processed version of this data set. If I look at the spectra in this case, I can see that they're actually a sparse matrix. So because the intensities in processed IMZML, um, each spectrum can have its own list of MZ values, so the data can be very sparse, um, at least when we represent it in a matrix-like form where we have a canonical list of MZ values. Uh, so that means even though I have um, 264 uh, rows or 264 MZ values essentially here, a lot of those um, might be zero and the data is actually going to be binned on the fly as, it's, as we read it from the file. So we can take a look at the canonical list of MZ values for the entire experiment using the MZ accessor here. So this is the list of MZ values for the entire uh, uh, data set in this case. But since it's processed uh, IMZML, each spectrum actually has its own list of MZ values. Um, if we want to look at those specifically, we can get at them with this MZ data uh, function. And what this returns is a relatively large list, in this case a list that would be 16,200 elements long, where each element is the list of MZ values for that particular spectrum. So I'm just going to get here the MZ values for the first spectrum, and I'll just get the first uh, six or so of those. So here I have the 
MZ values that are used for the entire data set and the MZ values that are actually um, corresponding to the first map spectrum. And we can see in this case that they're slightly different. And in this case, the, this file came in both continuous and processed IMZML because it's an example data set. So there is no need to actually store this particular data set as processed IMZML. Um, IMZML org just provides it in both formats uh, for the purposes of example. Um, um, so what I'm going to do now is take a look at the mass resolution of the continuous versus processed versions. So I can use this resolution function uh, to look at the mass resolution of the continuous and the processed data. Um, for the continuous data, um, it turns out that the MZ axis just has essentially fixed intervals of 0.8332825 on its MZ axis. Uh, the resolution for the processed version, um, this is something that's decided when the processed IMZ email is first into Cardinal. Uh, by default, it sets a resolution of 200 ppm, uh, or that's parts per million, and that's something that we can change when, whenever we want to read that file. So for example, here, I know from the continuous file that this, that, that this data actually just has um, MZ units of uh, three or so. So I'm going to go ahead and read the processed file again, but this time I'm going to set the resolution to 0 .83, 0 0.083 or so and use um, exact MZ units as the bin width rather than parts per million. And I'm also going to specify, pre-specify the mass range if you notice before, when we read uh, when we read processed IMZML, because each spectrum has its own MZ values, uh, Cardinal has to infer the mass range from the data. For larger data sets, that can take some time because it has to look at each MZ uh, list for each spectrum. So if we know the mass range of the data set beforehand, it's often, it often can save a lot of time in terms of reading the data set if we can specify the mass range here. So I'm going to specify the mass range to the read MSI uh, function. I'm going to specify the resolution is 0 0.083 in absolute MZ values rather than in parts per million. If I read that in like so now, I'm going to go ahead and look at the first few MZ values Oops. for both versions now. And I guess they're still slightly different. I guess some rounding happened at some point. That should not usually be the case. But the point is that we can change uh, the resolution of the process data whenever we read it. Um, we can also change it after the fact if we want to change it later. Uh, so we can actually assign a new value to the resolution of the process data here. Here I'm going to set it to, again, the same thing, 0.0833. Oh, I was looking at the wrong one here. There we go. So a moment ago, I was trying to compare the, uh, the MZ values of the continuous versus the processed data. Um, and you can see that now that I've manually set the mass resolution to the same thing, continuous data, uh, the MZ values mostly match up. The, the value we got for the resolution was probably slightly rounded, so we can see that it's not uh, exactly right here. We're off by 0.0001. That will often be the case when we're using absolute MZ units.
And in addition to changing the resolution when we first read it in, if we decide later on that we want to use a different resolution for the process data, we can set the resolution later on. So here I'm going to S042P. This is the original version that I read in. And I'm going to update the resolution. I'm going to say um, use MZ units for the resolution and set it to 0 0.0833285. And we can see that changes the number. The MZ values are now going to be different because we're using a, um, a finer mass resolution here. So the mass range will stay the same, but it will recalculate the MZ bins. Uh, no underlying data is actually changed at all because all of the binning here is done only whenever we access the data. So no data, no actual data is changed. Um, this just updates the metadata for how the binning will be performed whenever we access the intensities. Um, this can also be done by actually assigning a new MZ value to the process data. This MZ function doubles as a way to create a vector of MZ values at a given resolution. So here, suppose I want to use MZ values from 225 to 250, which is the mass range, but with the resolution of 300 parts per million, this MZ function will create such a vector of MZ values and for the process data, I can actually just assign uh, those MZ values to the MZ values of the experiment, and it will automatically update the MZ values and the resolution. Um, so we can see here the number of rows change from 300 to 176. Um, all of those things just now, the uh, updating of the resolution and changing that, all of that just applies to the process data because each spectrum has its own MZ values, so we have to do a little bit of binning. Um, none of that is, is necessary or even possible for the continuous data since um, they all share the same, all the spectra share the same MZ values to begin with. All right, we're getting close to the halfway point. I'm going to stop for a moment and check in with everyone. Does anyone have any questions? How is everyone doing? Any questions, comments, or concerns? Yes. Uh, yes, so um, the, the entire data set will have the same MZ bins. Um, whenever we access the MZ values for the data set, those are the MZ values that will be used for all of the spectra. Each spec for the processed uh, IMZML um, specifically, each spectrum, the underlying data, the the underlying data for those mass spectra will have different MZ values depending on which spectrum they are, but in order for us to manipulate the data set, we're going to bin them to the same uh, MZ values for all the spectra. And again, that happens on the fly whenever we access the data, the underlying data and the files and all of that, none of that is changed. Um, changing the this part's the changing the mass resolution, um, and that part of uh, that, all of that will take, uh, should be very quickly because it doesn't change the underlying data. Once you actually access a mass spectrum or try to plot an image, that requires actually grabbing the intensities from the files, so that will take a variable amount of time depending on the size of the data set. Any other questions so far? All right, we're getting close to the halfway point, and this seems like a good place to um, pause for a bit. So I'm going to go ahead and um, stop for our refreshments break, and we will go ahead and come back um, at like uh, 10.55 or, well, since we're a small group, we'll just see when everyone comes back. But at the latest by 11, uh, 11 a.m. is when we will restart. So we'll go ahead and take a break now, um, be back no later than 11.